gotta do what you gotta do for new yarn. Hey everyone, welcome to or welcome back to my channel, Knee Knits. My name is Amy and here I talk about all things knitting and today's podcast episode number 20 and I'm going to be sharing with you guys one project that I've been working on, sharing some yarn shopping plans that I have upcoming and also answering some questions from you guys. As always, thank you so much for joining me today. You will notice that my setup is different. I am in my new home away from home. I am away on a work trip. I can share with you guys some people had questions. I'm in Poland in Europe, so I'm here for about a month and a half for work, and therefore I'm in a new room. This is a little kind of Airbnb style place that I'm living temporarily while I do work here, and I will be back home in the middle of next month. So that explains the new setup. I will also put out a little note that I am using my camera, but I'm not using my microphone that I usually use to record with, so audio might be a little bit different. I don't think you should have any issues hearing. I think it just might be a little bit less clear. It's not going to be the best quality, hence the reason why I use a different microphone, but for the traveling purposes, it was just easier to leave the microphone at home. But regardless of all of that, I hope that this video is easy for you to watch and to listen to, so we'll just get right into it. Now because I am traveling, I only brought with me two projects and I only have one on the needles currently, so I only have one project to share with you guys. I did not pack a lot of knitwear to actually wear, so I'm not wearing anything today, and I don't have any new acquisitions to share with you all. So. The podcast is going to be a little slim in terms of knitting content, but I am going to be doing a Q&A section at the end of this. So I keep mentioning this mysterious one project that I have, so let me grab it. And this is my zipper sweater. Also, I'm on a spinny chair, so if you see me moving in a spinny way, that's why. <laughs> so this is my zipper sweater. It has gotten a lot of progress since I last showed it to you all. Last time I showed it to you all, I was in the middle of knitting the collar flat. So since then, I have finished the collar, I have folded it, I have gotten through the short rows and the raglan shaping, and I have split for sleeves. So we're gonna talk about all of that right now. So the zipper sweater is a pattern by Petite Knit. I am doing the original zipper sweater pattern. She has a couple variations, including zipper sweater man and zipper sweater light, but this is the original zipper sweater. It is an Aran weight knit, and the suggested yarn that Petite Knit uses is Filcolana Peruvian Highland Wool, held together with a strand of silk mohair or the Filcolana Tilia, and those are the two yarns that I am using for this project. So the Peruvian color I'm using is charcoal. Actually, let me grab that to show you guys as well. So this is the Highland Wool. It is a 100% non-superwash Highland Wool in the color charcoal. I like how this color specifically has a lot of variation. It's a little dimensional. Not all of the Filcolana Peruvian colors are like this, but this one just happens to be, which I really love. And I am pairing it with Filcolana Tilia in the color black which I don't have the ball band with me right now, but as you would expect, it is a black silk mohair strand. And the two yarns held together are absolutely beautiful. I am just loving all of the dimension in the fabric between the sort of variegated charcoal color and then the deep black mohair. It just looks really cool. I feel like it shows off really well in the twisted rib. So really loving the yarn choice. It's so soft and plump, and I am knitting this on five and a half millimeter needles for the body. Uh, that is one size up from the suggested needle size of five millimeters. I just needed to size up to meet gauge, which is 15 stitches per four inches or 10 centimeters. So it's a very big chunky knit, in my opinion, as someone who spent the whole summer knitting mostly fingering weight garments, and then my go-to weight for sweaters is DK, usually on four millimeter needles. So to jump up to five and a half millimeter needles and work with a Aran weight yarn combo, it just, it feels very chunky to me, but obviously this is not the chunkiest yarn that's out there. So all that being said, this is knitting up super quickly and because it's literally the only project that I am working on right now, it's getting all of my attention and that's why it has as much progress as it does. So folding the collar, that was 
the first thing that I did since the last time I filmed a podcast. So the collar is cast on with a provisional cast on and then when the collar is the correct length you fold it so the wrong side is on the inside and the right side is on the outside. The flat portion of the collar is half twisted rib so on one side it's twisted but the inside is just one by one rib not twisted but because you're knitting flat you still have to do those twisted pearls through the back loop which you know i thought was fine obviously it's not the most fun stitch to knit but it wasn't that bad in my opinion and petite knit does give instructions on how to knit together the two live rows of the collar like the current row you're on and then the provisional cast on row and I thought it was kind of interesting because I had put the provisional cast on row back on a set of needles and then I had my live stitches on my working set of needles. So I was actually knitting into two needles with my like working needle, which was kind of funny. It's a little bit different than if you have done the Oslo hat where you also have to fold up the edge, but that's a cast on edge and not a provisional edge. So it's not sitting on a needle set. So you just sort of pick up the loop as if you were picking up a stitch and then knit those two together. So you're still just working with two needles, but for this, you have to work with three. I'm sure there's a way you could do it with just two needles, but it definitely was. <laughs> it took a lot of patience and I had to go slow, but it takes time. And there, are, I'm sure there are videos on it on YouTube, but Petite Knits Pattern, if you are maybe a more beginner knitter, I don't think she wrote out the directions and how to do it super clearly. If you don't like Judy's Magic Cast On, I don't really think it was necessary to do that cast on, but any sort of provisional would have worked. I'm hoping you guys can see this. This is the inside of the sweater where it's joined and it's very smooth. There's no bump at all. It's not, it's very stretchy and it's not like stiff at all, which I like. And then from the outside, it looks very clean and seamless. And then as part of the collar folding, you do leave some stitches live here because this will get knit eventually for the inner facing of the zipper. So I have a few stitches on this little tied off stitch holder here that gets knit at the very end so you have somewhere to sew the zipper into. So all of that with the collar, probably the most complex part of the zipper sweater besides the actual sewing in of the zipper itself because after that it's smooth sailing, pretty standard knitting for a top down raglan. You immediately go into short rows at the back once you connect the collar and then you do the raglan increases and then you just knit flat with raglan increases until you join in the round for the for the body. So hopefully ignoring my little stitch holders that are in there, you can see the opening for the zipper and then it ends right about here. And then you do continue on the raglan shaping past the zipper connection point, which I think is nice because I feel like a lot of times with v-necks in knitting or things with like an open neck like this, sometimes they connect at the same point that you'd split for the sleeves and it's just too deep. But I like how this stops before. I think it's more proportional to like a well-fitting quarter zip or half zip sweater. Now, one thing that I have done differently in the pattern so far is the addition of selvage stitches in the body along the zipper edge. So while you are knitting the collar, you slip the first stitch of every row to give a slip stitch edge, which looks very clean and very tidy for the ribbing. But then when you get into the stockinette body, the pattern specifically says not to continue slipping the first stitch of each row and to knit just pure stockinette back and forth. Now I have knit the zipper sweater man before and I followed the directions in that pattern which said the same thing, don't do selvage stitches for the body. And then when I was sewing on the zipper, I just didn't like the way it looked because the stockinette edge sat right at the front at the edge of the zipper is like very visible and it just wasn't very tidy looking. I didn't like how the stitches were kind of wonky, some were tight, some were loose. I did that differently here because I knew from experience that I didn't like the way it looked before, but I don't know if that was the right decision. Like maybe there was a reason Petit Knit wanted us to not include the selvage edge at the body because these stitches became very loose in sort of a different way than they look with the twisted rib. Like you can see that the twisted rib looks very neat, but then with the stockinette body, the selvage stitches, I feel like they look looser. 
but they still look more even and it might be easier to see from the inside because it's curling so much. And I, I mean, it is what it is. So I think I'm gonna wait until I sew down the zipper and finish the project to give you guys a recommendation as to if I were to knit this for a third time, what I would do with the selvage stitches at the body. I'm also a little bit worried because the selvage edge stitches are so loose that it just may not give enough fabric to physically sew the zipper onto and maybe the zipper won't be as secure. So again, we're gonna wait and see how that actually turns out in the end, but that's my current status with what I did for the selvage edges at the stockinette body. Now I have been really enjoying this knit. It's been so nice to knit with these chunky needles. I love how you just knit a couple rows and then boom, you already have an inch of fabric. So it's really nice. It's really squishy and soft. And I have not knit something with this much positive ease in a long time because most of my summer garments that I knit maybe had a maximum of three to four inches of positive ease. So this pattern calls for 13 inches of positive ease, which is so much, but I mean, I want that. I do want a very big oversized zipper sweater. With the raglan increases, you know, every round gets bigger and bigger and it was just, it's been taking a long time to get through each round. So to say that I'm very excited that I split for sleeves is an understatement. I'm very glad that <laughs> I don't have hundreds of stitches on the needles anymore. I did wanna do a quick try on for you guys to show you guys what it looks like on, cause I think it looks really good and it's making me excited to keep going. Although it's really hot today and my apartment doesn't have air conditioning and I had to close the windows because I didn't want the outdoor noises to come in, so this will not be on for very long, but isn't it so cute? I think it looks so good. I'll tuck these in so you can get the, the full picture. And of course I'm wearing black on black, but hopefully you can still see the difference. I think it looks great. Oh, it looks so good. And then from the back, use my little spinny chair. That's what it looks like from the back. <laughs> wow, yeah, I'm excited for this. I can totally see it with the zipper and I don't know if I'll ever zip it up like all the way around my neck. It's definitely pretty tight because it's not blocked so all the ribbing is really cinching in on itself. But, oh my gosh, on a super cold day, this is gonna be so awesome to wear. <laughs> I'm so excited for it. Yeah, ooh, so fun. All right, it's coming off now. The Peruvian Highland wool only has 100 meters per ball, so I've been adding new balls very frequently for this project. I think this is the fifth ball or the fourth, I can't remember, but I've been doing the spit splicing technique to join a new yarn because this is a non-superwash wool, so it's super easy, although I do not use my actual spit because that grosses me out too much. I don't think I'll ever bring myself to do that, but I just run my hand under the water and the sink real quick, and then this is a four-ply yarn, so I will cut two plies off from each end. So total, I still have four plies, and then I rub them together, and it's a really nice join, and because this yarn is so dark, and then there's also the mohair on top of it, you really, you cannot see it all where I splice the yarn together. So if you're doing non-superwash wool, totally recommend spit splicing with just water. I would, I'm not going back to any other method. Now, I am jumping ahead to a question, although this is not the question section. A lot of people ask me how I join new balls of yarn in my projects. I normally will just leave a tail of the old ball about like six inches long, like this long, so I have enough to weave in, and then I'll just start knitting with the new ball at the next stitch, also leaving a tail of about six inches, and then those stitches are always like a little bit loose until you can actually go back and weave in the ends in the opposite direction, but I don't do anything fancy. I'm not really into knots, so I don't do the magic knot ball or the magic knot I meant. So that's usually how I join my balls of yarn. All right, and that's all I can share about my zipper sweater project. Totally weird that I don't have anything else to share with you guys in terms of what I am currently knitting, because you guys know I always have a lot of projects going on, but it feels nice to focus on one project at a time for once, it's kind of refreshing. But I will get into some future plans. I am specifically going to be talking about what I am going to be shopping for here in Europe because I feel like I have 
a lot of yarn that I have never tried before that I want to try. So I'm going to share with you guys some of my upcoming plans and some of the things I will say might answer some of the Q&A questions I got. So if you asked a question about what yarn I plan on looking for while I'm here, this whole section basically answers that. So yeah, like I said at the beginning of the video, I am in Poland, here in Europe. At first I was like, I don't know if I'll share what country I'm going to, but I feel like still sharing the country is vague enough for my privacy, but enough context for you guys to sort of understand where I am, because I think that helps a lot with knowing what's going on with me. But I don't really live currently where there are a lot of yarn stores at all, so there's nothing that I can shop at, like, in the town or city I'm near or in, but I am planning some, sorry, I keep looking at my laptop, it's over here with my notes, but I am planning some weekend trips to some other cities while I'm here, which I'm super excited for. I am planning a trip to Berlin, Germany. I have a trip planned to Oslo, Norway, and I might be able to squeeze one other weekend trip in there while I'm here, but I have not made that plan yet. So yeah, I know there are a lot of yarn stores in Berlin, a lot of yarn stores in Oslo, so I've been narrowing down what I want to shop for because if I just show up to those yarn stores without a plan, it's not going to go well. <laughs> it's not going to go well for my bank account and it also would just make me more stressed because I would be overwhelmed with the options and not know how to narrow down my choices. So as I've been making my yarn shopping wish list, Obviously my focus is going to be yarn that I can get in Europe but might not necessarily be able to get as easily at home for me in the US. Now in the age of internet and global shipping, I feel like that there are not a lot of yarns that I cannot get at home. You know, there are always shops that will sell, there are always shops that will ship. It's more of a matter of cost, so I am going to be looking at yarns that the cost might be significantly cheaper here because it's more local and I do notice that a lot of European yarns that end up in the US are just marked up a little bit more. So the first brand that I'm going to be seeking out at yarn stores here in Europe is Filcolana. In my experience, Filcolana is pretty difficult to find in the US, both in retail shops and also online. I feel like there are not a lot of options to get them shipped to the US without significantly high markups or costs for that shipping. So I'm definitely going to be seeking out some Filcolana. I have used Filcolana Peruvian, Filcolana Tilia, and Filcolana Arweta. I have loved them all so much. It is such a high quality yarn and I feel like for the price point it's a very good value. It's not super expensive and the quality that you get. I've just really enjoyed all of their yarns. So I do want to get some yarns from them that I have not tried before on my list. I do want to try Filcolana Pernilla, Pernilla, Pernilla? I think it's just Pernilla. <laughs> and that is their DK weight, but I believe it's a merino wool. Actually, let me look it up. Oh, it's not merino. It's the DK version of the Peruvian Highland wool, which, you know, oops, just as good because I love the worsted weight version. So a DK weight version would definitely be valuable to me because I love knitting DK weight sweaters and they have a really good color selection. I do also really want to try Filcolana Merci, which is their fingering weight, 50% wool, 50% cotton yarn. I think it would be really nice to try for some summer t-shirts. It is the suggested yarn in Petite Knits Sunday Tea, which is on my queue to knit. So if I can grab some yarn for that project, I would be very excited. I also want to try Filcolana Alva, which is their lace weight alpaca yarn. And Alva is commonly used as a second strand in some projects if you want to add some alpaca to your projects without wanting like that fluffy mohair or a fluffy surrey. And that Filcolana Alva can also be used for accessories. I think Petite Knit uses it as a suggested yarn option in her penny gloves for a 100% alpaca penny glove, which I think would be really cool. And the Tilia Silk Mohair, I really have enjoyed knitting with. I'd love to grab some more for future projects. I feel like it's a very high quality silk mohair. I have not tried a very large selection of silk mohairs. I've tried uh, Santa Scarn Tin Silk Mohair, Knitting for Olive Soft Silk Mohair, and now Filcolana Tilia. And out of all those three, Tilia and Soft Silk Mohair are my top two. Another European yarn brand that I have not found very easily in the US is Gepard. And Gepard Garn, I believe is a Danish yarn brand, and I'd love to try some and get some while I'm here. They have a bunch of different varieties. The yarns that I'm specifically looking for 
are Pure Alana. I have been wanting to make my favorite knitwear's sweater number nine light, which is a DK weight version of sweater number nine, which I have made before. And I think a DK weight version will be a really nice project. The suggested yarn is Pure Alana, which is a 50% alpaca, 50% merino wool yarn. And I think that would be a really cool type of yarn to knit with. I think it's DK weight, so all good things could easily grab a sweater quantity of that if I find it. Gepard Garn Wild and Soft I also want to try, as well as their Cashmere Lace. And my favorite things knitwear holds those two yarns together for her T number one pattern, which is also on my to knit list. And I know I've said that wool or like warm fiber t-shirts are not really my thing, but I don't know, this would have to be an exception to the rule. I just really like her sample piece. If I could find those exact yarns that she used in that exact navy blue color combo, I just think it looks so good. I really like how the t-shirt sleeve is really long, so I think that might make it more practical to wear with the cool weather fibers. So if I can find both of those yarns by Gepard here, I will definitely pick them up. The Gepard Cashmere Lace is also an option for accessories, like if I wanted to make another set of penny gloves out of those, or maybe even like a little neck scarf, I think that would be a good option to grab a few skeins in a few different colors for small accessories. Could be good for gifting too. I also want to try Dererum Natura yarns. They are a French brand and I know that they're more widely sold in the US but I have yet to try knitting with them and I do know that they are a little bit cheaper here than in the US so if I can get some Dererum Natura yarn in my hands I might pick some of that up as well. Their Gilead yarn I have an interest in. That's their worsted weight wool. I have yet to knit a few worsted weight sweaters, but I kind of want to get into them maybe this winter. So I think it would be a good thing to put in my yarn collection to have a sweater quantity of worsted weight wool for a potential project. I do also want to find some Sanis Garn Pure Gint. Now Sanis Garn is pretty easy to get in the US. I feel like in the past year or so, a ton of retailers have started selling them, including the local yarn store near me at home. Like I can just drive 10 minutes and get Sanis Garn. However, Again, with the price markups, if I can get and fit this yarn in my luggage, I will probably pick some up. I do want to try some pure gint in a sweater quantity. I haven't really decided what pattern I would make with it. I am debating the Eva cardigan, the storm sweater. I know there are a ton of other options. It's a DK weight, 100% wool. So there's pretty much limitless options for knitting with that type of yarn. And the last time I was in Europe, I saw Pure Gint retailing for about five US dollars a ball. And right now at home at my local yarn store, it's about $8 a ball. So that's a big cost savings that I would have if I was able to pick some up here. Although if I don't find any, or if I find that I have been spending too much money on yarn, by the time I get to it, I could easily pass on it because I know I can find it at home. Other yarn brands that are kind of in that similar category where they do sell it where I live at home, but it's just a little bit more expensive. So I don't really need to buy it here, but it will be a good opportunity. And that includes Isagar yarn. My local yarn store at home also carries it. But again, I have yet to try a lot of their wool yarns and I think it would be a really nice yarn brand to try as well as Knitting for Olive. I have knit with most Knitting for Olive yarns except for their Merino which is funny because it's like their most popular yarn. I'm surprised I haven't tried it yet, but I can pretty easily get it at home. So I'm not gonna go out of my way to find it or buy it. I did also, while I was online browsing the yarn stores that I plan on visiting, saw that some stores carry drops in person, which I have yet to try any drops yarn. And this is a question that someone submitted if I have tried drops yarn or if I want to. I definitely want to try it, I just haven't yet. So if I see any in person at a yarn store, maybe I'll pick up a couple balls to give it a try. I know Drops is very affordable and people have their favorites. I have to re-watch some of <laughs> Typical Bliss's videos because I know there's a couple of yarns from Drops that she loves and really recommends so I'll go get her recommendations and if I find those yarns maybe I'll pick up a few. Now all those yarn brands I just listed they're pretty mainstream. Everyone pretty much knows about them and I do want to try a lot more like local yarns and I think those are just hard for me to research ahead of time. I'm planning on when I go to different yarn stores, maybe either talking to a worker there or seeing if they have sections in their store that say like, oh, this is local. I haven't really done much research on that. I'm more just waiting for 
that to present itself at each yarn store because I would love to get some locally dyed yarn here or yarn that might be a little bit lesser known and more rare. I of course have to be conscious of my luggage space. I only packed one large checked luggage and one carry-on and they were honestly pretty full so I am going to be buying or using a new duffel bag to go home with for all of this yarn because I'm not gonna be able to fit it so <laughs> that was a decision that I made after I arrived here and I unpacked everything I was like I'm maybe gonna have room for a couple balls of yarn and I want to get more than that so I do have the opportunity to check two bags with my flight home so I'll probably get a duffel here like something cheap at the supermarket that I can just stuff some yarn in and yeah <laughs> that was just me not being prepared enough when I was packing to come over here, but gotta do what you gotta do for new yarn. All right, now we'll get into questions. So I had put a little Q&A box on my Instagram story and you guys delivered with the questions. I was typing them all up and I have over a hundred questions. I'm not doing them all today. So a lot of them were repeats. So obviously if I answer your question, it might not be exactly how you worded it, but you probably asked the similar thing. Um, I'm gonna try to put those questions into my next sequential podcast while I'm here So I think it'll be a fun little section to keep going and hopefully get to all of them at some point But I just picked sort of a random batch today Some of them are knitting focused yarn focused some are more personal about me. So let's get into it The first one is do you have any other crafty hobbies and I will probably answer that as no I definitely have made knitting my main hobby and when I was younger I dabbled in a bunch of different crafts and maybe I had different phases. I think I had a painting phase where I was watching a lot of Bob Ross videos and I really wanted to learn how to paint well. That was very short-lived, didn't last very long. I did a lot of those like craft kits growing up so when I was younger I probably had a lot more crafts but right now I pretty much only knit. I do crochet sometimes and I think a lot of you guys know that but not nearly as much as I knit. I do own a Cricut. I bought one thinking I would use it more than I actually do so that was maybe another potential craft phase that just never stuck. <laughs> I do like to bake. I don't know if that's a crafty hobby but I feel like people who like to craft tend to also like to bake so I do like to bake cookies and cakes and brownies and stuff, but knitting is definitely my main thing. Someone asked if I'm going to Rhinebeck, and I am not going to Rhinebeck this year, unfortunately. I would love to, and I don't live very far, so it would be a pretty easy day trip for me. The reason I'm not going this year is because my friend is getting married that weekend, so we are going to the wedding instead of Rhinebeck, but I'm hoping that next year, if I have no other conflicts, I will be able to go. It seems like a really fun time. And there were a couple questions about if I have a dream project or a project that I am maybe intimidated by and like a dream challenge knit that I hope to complete one day. I feel like those are all kind of similar questions, so I'll sort of answer them all at once. For me, I feel like anything with brioche or like all over half fisherman's rib in a very fine gauge is something I would love to knit one day and I don't know if I have the motivation to do that just yet. For example, Andrea Mowry's birch pullover, which I have mentioned before, I really like that pattern and I really do wanna knit it one day, but I know it's going to take a lot of time and effort. So I don't have immediate plans to knit it, but it kind of is like a dream project. Similarly, Petite Knits Annette cardigan, that all over brioche cardigan, it's such a gorgeous pattern. It is absolutely beautiful and to be able to knit one and wear it and then say that I made it is definitely a dream of mine. But again, similarly, I don't think it'll happen anytime soon. I have yet to do a brioche project, but I'm gonna try knitting a brioche hat later this winter to sort of ease my way into brioche. So we'll see how that goes. And then maybe one day I'll get to do the Annette cardigan as well. Somebody asked what my favorite animal is and if I have a favorite mythical animal, which I thought was really funny and a unique question. In terms of animals, I am honestly not a big animal person. I did not grow up with any pets and I think that just sort of affected how I'm not a huge animal fan, but as I've gotten older, I think I like cats. I think if I were to ever own a pet, it would be a cat. I think they're really cute and I like their somewhat calm 
nature. Although every time I say that to people who own cats, they say that cats are not calm, but <laughs> I like how they're quiet compared to dogs per se. And then my favorite mythical animal. I don't know if I have any favorite mythical animals. I'm not really into like the mythical world. Like, I don't know, unicorns are kind of cool because <laughs> I like their like rainbow color theme because that's what I think of when I think of unicorns, but I don't know if that's a good answer to the question, but there you go. I did get a couple questions on my favorite fiber and my favorite fiber and yarn definitely has to be a non superwash merino. I just love how smooth it knits up, how smooth and even it blocks out. It's so comfortable to wear. I just, I love merino wool, can't get enough of it. And then there were a lot of questions about my job and my schooling experience. The questions were, what kind of engineering do you do? Someone commented, my husband is a mechanical aerospace engineer, which is awesome. How did you get your engineering job? Uh, someone asked, if you went to RPI, was it hard being a girl in a mostly male school? So I'll answer those all at once. And yeah, so my undergrad degree, I went to RPI, which is Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. It is a mostly engineering and science school in New York. It's on the smaller size and most students there will study some form of engineering or computer science or other science background. And at the time that I attended that school, the ratio of male to female was around 70% male to 30% female. And I think it still is that way at that school. So it is very male dominant and engineering and STEM is still currently a pretty male dominated field. So yeah, because of that ratio, it was pretty easy to make friends with the guys at school and the girls were harder to find, I guess. I feel like my freshman year, I got into a friend group that was mostly guys and then maybe like one or two of us were girls. And I was really craving more of a girl friend group. So it wasn't until my sophomore year that I decided to join a sorority on campus. We did have Greek life and the sorority really helped enhance my college experience because I was able to get that female community that I really wanted and I think I needed. So I am very grateful that they had the sorority there and my experience with them was really good. And some of my closest friends that I'm still in contact with today from college are from that sorority. So besides that, you know, my classes, you know, there are definitely more guys than girls. Yeah, I think it's just something I became adjusted to. And now that I work in the engineering field, the ratio is still pretty male dominant. And that's just something that I've it's become normal to me, I think. I'm used to it because I had it both in college and at work. So you just learn to seek out friendships and relationships with the females if that's something that you desire and think that you need. And just don't be afraid to go up and talk to someone and say, hey, you like you wanna hang out or can I ask you a question? I think everyone secretly wants those connections but might be too afraid to initiate. So just never be afraid to initiate a new connection if you think it would be worthwhile. So yeah, that was my college experience. I did meet my husband, Nick, there at college. We went to the same school. So if anything, maybe the male to female ratio was in my favor in that sense. <laughs> Although I wasn't specifically looking at school for that, but it worked out. So someone did ask how I met my husband and that's the answer to that question. To lead into how I got my engineering job, I don't really have a cool story. I just applied to a bunch of different jobs and the job that I'm at now is the job that gave me an offer while I was in my senior year of college. So that was cool. I'm glad that I think I got lucky. My first job out of college is one that I really enjoy and am still at. Some people don't get that lucky and they might need to switch after just one year because they discover it's not what they wanted to do, but that's completely fine. Everyone has different experiences with that. So my current job is a systems engineering position, although I did not get my degree in systems engineering. I learned a lot on the job for my position. So yeah, I think that covers all of the engineering based school work questions. <laughs> the next question is, did I order anything from the Sorella Halloween collection? And I did not. I loved it. It was a super cute collection. I loved the little like Halloween party boxes that she made with like stickers and the wool wash and the yarn. I just you know, trying to 
not order from every pre-order that I am aware of, <laughs> which takes a lot of discipline, but you know, you have to pass on some of them, even though they're all beautiful. The next question is, what was my experience traveling and knitting? For example, getting through TSA and packing. And I will say I did just upload my pack with me video. I filmed my whole packing experience for this six week long trip. And I shared what I was putting in my carry on luggage and my checked in baggage. Now let's start with just within the US. Now I have flown around the US to various locations with my knitting needles that are metal and I've never had any issues. The TSA website does state that in the US knitting needles are allowed of any material of any length on carry-on and checked baggage. Again, ultimately your decision rests with the TSA agent. So it's not 100%, maybe it's like 98%, and I personally have never had any issues in the US. Now, flying internationally, every country and their airports are gonna have different security measures, and I will say I have gotten my needles confiscated at one airport before. It was in the Bucharest airport in Romania. I was traveling with my Oslo sweater whip at the time. It was on four and a half millimeter needles. I was using my metal, you know, chrome plated needles that I always use. They went through the scanner and the agent took them and said they were not allowed. Now I did have the opportunity to ask. I think at the time I was angry. <laughs> so maybe I asked them a little bit aggressively what the reason was. But in hindsight, I'm glad that I pushed because I was able to get an explanation that I would have never have guessed with knitting needles. And I pulled it up here. And the agent informed me at that airport that my metal knitting needles fell into the category of, and quotes, this is on their website, a knife including ceremonial stilettos with blades longer than six centimeters of metal or any other metallic material sufficiently resistant to be used as a weapon. So if you're reading a security website, you probably would never read that and think that it applies to knitting needles. But if you picture a metal knitting needle and it's only a four and a half millimeter diameter, I can totally understand how it is interpreted as a ceremonial stiletto or a knife made of a material that can be used as a weapon. So obviously at that point, I was not gonna argue anymore. They took my needles, I was in their hands, I was sad about it, but now I know in the future that I do look for sort of the knife section in airport security websites to see what they categorize as knives or points that could be used as a weapon. And if it has any language saying that anything that could be used as a weapon, I just play it safe and put everything in my checked luggage. So obviously this is just for metal needles, so it sounds like wooden needles would not really have an issue. Again, I think there's always a risk because they are sharp and pointy, but definitely read up on whatever airports you are traveling to, both layovers and you know initial flights out because some airports, whether or not it's your final destination, you do have to go through security again. So that was pretty wordy and a lot of details. I feel like long story short, if you're worried about losing needles, Put them in your checked bag if you are not worried and are okay with maybe parting with them you can risk it and put them in your carry-on a couple of people asked my favorite yarns someone asked specifically a recap of my favorite yarn for each season so pretty quickly i guess spring and summer i feel like would be similar i'm not sure but my favorite summer yarn is definitely santa's gone lena their worsted weight cotton linen viscose blend. I feel like it's just really nice to knit with and it wears really well and it's machine washable and they have a ton of colors and it's really nice. And for winter or colder weather knits, I love Sandus Garn Sunday. Their fingering weight merino is just lovely. It is so smooth and it's so well, it blocks so beautifully. They have a ton of beautiful colors and I love pairing that with knitting for olive soft silk mohair. I definitely would recommend it over the Sandus Garn tin silk mohair. I'm not the biggest fan of that yarn, but the knitting for olive silk mohair in combination with the Santa's Garn Sunday is one of my favorite yarn combos of all time. And the last question I will answer today is why did you start making videos? Just really curious, love your content. <laughs> Thank you. And then a follow-up question from somebody else, does your family and coworkers know about your channel? So I started making videos because I just love knitting so much and I just really wanted to have a space where I could talk about it with people. And I was kind of doing that through Instagram. I got really into my Instagram profile and I would post 
stuff about my projects with very long captions just sharing all of my ideas and stuff and I feel like Instagram became a very sort of short form or like quick format social media place where people were not spending time reading all of the things I was writing and just sort of quickly going through the photos and I just feel like YouTube was a better platform to really dive into all of my projects and the people who would want to hear what I had to say would eventually find me more easily than on Instagram so that was my main reason for wanting to start YouTube. I just had so much excitement about all my knitting. I just needed to share it and Instagram just wasn't cutting it. And YouTube, um, I've been really enjoying it so far. I feel like making videos is now a very exciting part of my life. And I love um, sharing it with you guys and hearing your guys talk in the comments and just, it's really nice. So I definitely have been getting what I've been wanting out of YouTube is just like creating a little virtual knitting community and it's been a really good time. My family and coworkers do know about my channel. They're all super supportive. They get really excited when I tell them that, oh, I'm on YouTube and they're like, wow, no way, that's so cool. And then they check it out and they're, they're just very excited and supportive, which is fun. I don't expect any of them to watch my videos because I think if you don't knit, my videos are probably really boring or hard to follow. So but people still say they subscribe and even if they don't watch, I appreciate it. So yeah, <laughs> in general, most people know I'm on YouTube and are really supportive. And that was the last question I was gonna answer for today and it brings us to the end of today's video. Uh, thank you again for joining me. I'm super excited to bring you along my little temporary knitting journey here in Europe and I'm excited to do some yarn shopping and share my experiences with you guys. So until the next video, I'll see you next time.